Last section of the semester. Woo! All right, here we go. This uh, last section, we don't really go too much depth in this thing called the normal curve. Um, if you are going to take you're going to take any sort of statistics class, this is a topic that you will go into great, great detail about. So we are just going to skim the surface and make you aware that there is this thing called the normal curve. So what you will begin to see is as you get more and more data, we looked at our histograms and we made histograms, those bar graphs. As you get more and more data, you get more and more of a spread of values. Okay, uh, you, you can kind of hit uh, every particular value that, uh, that is possible in a situation. And so what we begin to call things is this idea of distributions. We're talking about the distribution of our data uh, around a particular set of values. So just to kind of illustrate what a distribution is, the first picture here is what's called a rectangular distribution. And in a rectangular distribution, what happens is each value occurs with the same frequency. And so you get that rectangle that you can you can see on the screen. So whatever these values are for the for the different for the different classes, uh, you can see that their frequency all goes to the same uh, the same level on the y axis. That's called a uniform distribution. It's also called a rectangular distribution. Both of those words can be used interchangeably. Now. If we were in statistics, if I was if I was teaching you a little bit more about how to uh, how to calculate frequencies and things like this, what we would talk about is the relationship between a distribution's graph and probability. And so, what you will be told, we, again, we don't have a whole lot of of time or ability to do this. But if you remember from our probability chapter, if you add up everything that can possibly happen, the probability, the sum of all those probabilities, is one. So, for any distribution like this rectangle, what you would say is that okay, the area of this rectangle is one. It represents every possible thing that can happen. So then, what you'll begin to do is say, okay, well then what's the probability that I would get a value say from from here to here and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna darken this bit of it so then the probability becomes the ratio of the area of the box that I just made versus the full rectangle so there is this relationship between area of my graph and probability. And that becomes something that's very uh, powerful when you are studying statistics and doing, doing probability. So the next type of distribution that we encounter are called skewed distributions. Skewed distributions are called that because they have tails. So this one on the left is called skewed to the right because the tail of values, these kind of outlying values that are different than the, the bulk, you know, the bulk, bulk and body of the graph is right here. So you get these X values that occur with these frequencies out on the side. That's skewed to the right. It's also called positively skewed. So depending on what textbook you're looking at or what application, and it's called positively skewed because again, the tail is on the positive side of the number line. It, there, the tail is getting bigger. And similarly, for the skewed to the left, again, you see the tail occurs on the left. And so we can see that this is negatively skewed. So something interesting happens with my, with my skewed distributions. Okay, when we're talking about our, our mean and our median and our mode that we, that we went over last time, remember the mean is the measure of center that takes into account every value. And in fact, if you remember the picture that I drew, it's all the distances of the values, the distances below the mean and the distances above the mean, they add up to zero. 
You have the same amount of distance below the mean as you have above the mean. And then there's the median. The median measures the center based on the actual physical center, meaning there's just as much data below as there is above the median. And then the mode measures the center based on frequency. The, the value with the most frequency is the mode. So we can label the mean, the median, and the mode on these skewed distributions to see their relationship. This is something you're responsible to know on my test and also on the final exam, there is a question. So put a little asterisk by this skewed discussion and, and know this. So first we'll label the mode. The mode is with the highest frequency. So it's gonna be the point in the graph that is the tallest. And so the modal value, and remember we're gonna use a, we're gonna use a capital M, that's our symbol for the mode. The modal value is right here where when I look up, the top of the curve is tallest. That's my mode. And then what happens is the mode, the, the median, and the mean all have different values. So again, when we skew this, this distribution and we have these values in the tail, we've taken a certain number of values out of the body of this graph and we move them over to the tail. So what that does is that moves the median. We have to account for this percentage right here in the, remember the median is half below the value, half above the value. So this is not to scale. I'm just trying to show you the order that these things skew in, the median goes next. So the median is going to be bigger than the mode when you skew to the right, because that tail, that tail, those values move the, that they move the center of 50% above and 50% below. Uh, they skew it positively or they skew it to the right. And the last one is, remember the mean takes into account the distance. Well, these values right here in the tail are all very significantly different than the bulk of the values. So what that does is it, stretches the mean out, oops, I should have dotted that like the other ones, sorry about that, stretches the mean out even more. And so there, there would be my mean. So your mode is the smallest one when you're skewed to the right, your median is bigger than the mode and your mean gets skewed the most. So it is the largest when you're skewed to the right. And we can talk about the same thing skewed to the left. The order is just going to be reversed. Again, the mode, the modal value is right here where the curve is the tallest. The mean, because we have to, or excuse me, the median, we have to account for the percent of values that are, are in the tail now. So the median gets skewed to the left uh, a little bit more. So it's less than the mode this time. And then the mean, the mean is most susceptible to outlying values. We saw that, remember we had the data set that was all numbers that were like 11 and 12 and 23. And then we had the one value that was 385. And what that did is that skewed the mean and it was the mean of that data set was bigger than all but that, all but that last value. So the mean is most susceptible to outlying values. So that were those relationships right there on skewed to the left, skewed to the right, you do need to know the relationship between the mean, the median, and the mode uh, for, for those curves. So all that to say, again, there's not much we can do with, with these because we don't necessarily have the mathematical, uh, the mathematical wherewithal to do it. But we're just driving to this idea of distributions. And so down at the bottom of the page, you can see, I've just given you some example of normal distributions. Sometimes the normal distribution is called a bell curve because it kind of looks like a bell. And what I've done just in the different colors that you can see on the screen, I've shown you that normal distributions, every one of those, the red one, the yellow one, the blue one, the green one, the purple one, they are all examples of normal distributions, but they all have different attributes. And so the basic attributes of a normal distribution is the, the, norm, the normal distribution is symmetric about its middle. Whoops, I'm off the screen here. The normal distribution is symmetric about its middle. And what that means is if, if, the, if the curve is like a greeting card and I was to fold it, it's the same on both sides. In fact, I'm gonna draw it on that tallest one, the orange one. I'm just gonna, this is kind of like the fold of the greeting card right here. And so the normal distribution is symmetric about the, the middle. And so the, 
you notice one of the differences is those normal curves are all like spread out a different amount, like the, the, the red one or the orange one, whatever color that is, that's right in the middle, the tallest one, it is narrower uh, and it goes taller versus the purple one that you can see is flatter and it's more spread out. And so we can measure the, we can measure how spread out a normal curve is by using something called the standard deviation. And what the standard deviation is, is it is a way to measure how spread out the normal curve is. So my normal distribution is symmetric about its middle, which is a nice thing. That's going to give us some ability to, uh, to, to do some fun problems, which is going to be the, the big culmination to this section. The standard deviation is the way that I can measure how uh, spread out the value is. And I think that's about all I have to say as far as those general characteristics. So we're going to flip the page and we're going to get a little bit more detailed about our normal distribution. So the top of the next page, I've given you a blank normal distribution distribution, because I just want to mention, we looked at the mean, the median, and the mode for the skewed distributions. Where's the mean, the median, and the mode for my normal distribution? Well, this is a little bit more interesting. So right here in the middle, again, the mode is what value occurs most frequently, the tallest part. So we see that the mode right here this is the tallest part. So the middle, that line that the normal curve is symmetric about as if it was a greeting card, that is the modal value. Notice this as well, that since it's symmetric, symmetric means the same. That means that in this middle value, I have 50% of the data to the left and I have 50% of the data to the right. Well, that is the exact definition of the median. So this middle line is also the median, so x squiggly. Well, if we had the time to do it, we could sit here and say, hey, hang on. For each, for each different value, notice there is, it's, since it's symmetric, I've got the same distance above as I do below. And remember, the mean is the measure of how much data is above that middle value and how much data is below. So because this is symmetric, there's the same amount below as the same amount above. So also the mean is at this middle value. So this is an interesting characteristic of my normal distribution is that the mean, the median, and the mode all have the same value. And that is that middle value uh, that we find right there in the, in the center of the, of the curve. So that's something that you need to know. That is a characteristic, that the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same, that from this middle value, 50% of the data is below and 50% of the data is above. So again, some of these attributes that we have. So the, the last thing that I'm gonna mention before we do some problems on this is, okay, I mentioned to you that there, uh, there was this thing called the standard deviation. And if you take statistics, you learn how to calculate that uh, and, and figure that out for different data sets. That's not going to be our objective, but I wanna give you a picture of what it is. And so another interesting thing about my, about my normal curve is that, okay, so my mean is here in the middle. I'm gonna use the letter S for the standard deviation. I am intentionally using the, I told you this last time, I'm intentionally using the uh, representation for samples since that's really all we've talked about in this class. We haven't talked about populations. They get different letters and I'm gonna leave that to you when you get to your statistics class. So if anybody's watching this video and are like, you're using the wrong letters, I'm intentionally doing that because in this class, we only talk about samples. So what we have, you see these dotted lines on this normal curve I've given you. What we know about every normal curve, no matter how, how condensed it is or how spread out it is, is it, uh, it, it abides by this same principle. This is called the empirical rule. Does 
It's called the empirical rule. Sorry that my hand was in the way and you couldn't, uh, you couldn't write along with me right there. And what the empirical rule says is this. So if, if I'm at the mean and I go above the mean and below the mean, one standard deviation. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, okay, this next dotted line represents the mean plus a standard deviation. So X bar plus S, and then going backwards, this dotted line represents the mean minus a standard deviation, X bar minus S. Here's what we know. This is true of every normal curve, no matter how spread out, is that you will have between these two lines, one standard deviation in each direction, you will always have six, about 68% of your data values are within those two values, whatever they are. Next, if you go if you go from the mean and you go above, you go two standard deviations. So this time I'm going two hops, one, two. I'm going to the second dotted line away. So that is going to be uh, the mean plus two S. So the two S means two hops in that direction. And then backwards, I go X bar minus two S. I'm going two hops backwards. So what the two times S means is I'm just going two standard deviations. So from the mean, I'm going one, and then I'm going two. That's plus two S. And then from the mean, I'm going one backwards, and then two backwards. That's minus two S. Well, again, the empirical rule, what the empirical rule says is on every normal curve, no matter how thin or how flat or whatever it is, that 95% of your data values are going to be between two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above. Now, I didn't do the best job labeling my, I should have put the 68% up higher. Sorry, I'll know that for next semester. I know that doesn't help you, uh, but it'll help me in the future. And then last but not least, if I go three standard deviations, so if I go X bar plus three standard deviations, and then minus X bar minus three standard deviations. I'm gonna use a different color here so that it's noticeable. So what we know from the empirical rule is that from three standard deviations below to three standard deviations above, 99.7% of your data values are there. Yeah, that's uh, in case you're on the video, these are S's. So that's 3S, 2S, a plain old S, and then S, 2S, 3S. We had a little bit of a debate here about where the fives came from. They are not fives. They are the letter S right here. That stands for standard deviation. For the problems that I give you that are going to be on the test and the homework, you will be given the standard deviation because you don't know how to calculate it right now and, and how to do that. And one of the things you will learn in statistics is, well, hey, what if my data value isn't a full standard deviation away? What, it's, what if it's half a standard deviation? And you will learn that there's a lot of, uh, uh, that uh, even in that, the standard deviation is always going to be the same. You'll learn about a giant chart. It's called something called a Z-score. You don't need to know anything about that right now. I'm just getting excited for you. So what that means here is that anything beyond three standard deviations above or below, is called a, uh, a rare event. Okay. So anything that would be out here in the tails of your normal curve, this would be anything out there would be a rare event because because it is beyond three standard deviations. So this is the empirical rule. It's something that, again, if you take statistics, you'll, you'll see a lot. And if you don't take statistics, then you're gonna see it in a couple problems that we're going to do here. So I've got three problems for us based on the, uh, on the standard deviation. And then if you have any questions about this or any questions about anything in chapter 12, we'll have plenty of time to take them. And if not, then you'll have time to do your homework before you before you even uh, leave campus. I can open up the computer lab down the hall and you can hop on my math lab if you want to. Okay, so example one. I'm gonna do this example with you. 
So I'm gonna actually zoom out a little bit so I can put the whole problem on the screen. I know it's on your screen in class, but the aspect ratio is different for the camera that's going online. So here we go. Okay, so example one says this, in 2014, the mean height of American men was 70 inches with a standard deviation of four inches. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna label the following normal distribution. Okay, so we're gonna pretend this normal distribution represents the population of all the men in America. And we are going to put some numbers to these ranges. So the mean is this number right in the middle. How am I gonna label this line right in the middle? What's the mean? 70. So I'm not gonna put the units just because uh, I don't want to crowd this too much. So this is 70. So now the standard deviation is four inches. So that means that when I go one standard deviation above, this next dotted line is going to be 74 inches. Continuing on, I'm gonna add four more. The next standard deviation is 78 inches. And then the third standard deviation is 82 inches. So going backwards then, what, what am I, how am I gonna label one standard deviation below the mean? This is gonna be what? Okay, 66, now I'm just subtracting my standard deviation. And then the next one's gonna be 62 inches and then 58 inches. So that represents how spread out uh, the, 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 the heights of American men are. So now we're just going to answer these questions. It's just based on the empirical rule, which I gave you. So these are the different types of questions you'll see. What percent of men have heights between 62 and 78 inches? Okay, so 62 is right here and 78 is here. How many standard deviations is that for, for everyone who did, did not answer the question? How many standard deviations above and below the mean is that? Two, and the empirical rule says what percent of your data on any normal curve are within two standard deviations? That's 95. Yes, thank you very much, everybody, for your patience and for paying attention. So that's 95%. Yes. So the next question says, in a randomly selected sample of 750 men, how many would we expect to have heights between 66 and 74? So this is just an extension of the previous problem. First, let's figure out the percent. What percent of men are going to have heights between 66 and 74? Yeah, and the where you're getting that 68% from is you're remembering, okay, 66 is one standard deviation below and 74 is one standard deviation above. So the empirical rule said, how much data is between one standard deviation below and above? And you got that right, 68%. So I'm gonna use 0.68 since I'm doing some math with this instead of 68. And what am I gonna do with that 68% or 0.68 and the 750 men that I've selected? I'm going to multiply. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the 0.68 times 750. And I'm in my calculator now. You can have your calculator. That's going to be 510 is how many we would expect or somewhere pretty close to that to be in that range of heights. And then lastly, what is the height range that contains 99.7? Uh, percent of American men. So what range of heights would that be? Yep, that would be 58 inches all the way to 82 inches. And so then just for uh, benefit, in case you're curious about this, I am six foot three. So six times 12 is 72 uh, plus three is 75 inches. So where I would fall is I am just outside. I am not, I am not that atypically tall. I am right here. I'm one standard or just a little bit more than one standard deviation above the mean. That's me. That's the perkster is this, uh, this purple line right here. I think if I'm remembering right, I could be wrong, but it, it'll still make the point. Shaquille O'Neal, if you know who he is, basketball player, I think he's seven foot two. So seven foot two, seven times 12 is 84, plus two is 86. So he's 86 inches. So Shaquille O'Neal is out here. So he is a rare event. That's why you don't see a lot of 
American men as tall as Shaquille O'Neal walking around because he, his height is way out there on the tail and that is a rare event. And that's why you're gonna see people that are mostly, or men at least, you're gonna see American men that are mostly between 66 and 74. That's gonna be your most common. By the way, students always ask, hey, could you curve our grades? If you're asking for grades to be curved, what that means mathematically, and you might not realize it, what you really want is you want a grade shift. You want all the grades just to be shifted uh, up bigger, presumably. But if you ask somebody to curve your grade, what you're asking them to do is grade according to the normal curve. And what I would then do is say, if you really want that, then I would calculate the mean of the class and the standard deviation. And then that, what that would mean is 68% of you would get Cs. Okay, you would be in this range. And then the percentage here, which we could calculate, but I'm not going to bore you with the arithmetic, this percentage right here would get Bs. And then this percentage would get As. And then oh, likewise, this percentage would get Ds and this would get F. So when you ask somebody to grade on a curve, what you're really saying is you want only a certain number of people to be able to get As and then the uh, similar number of people to get Fs and it would be symmetric like that. So be careful what you ask for. Okay, you might just not be asking for what you're hoping for. Any question about this problem? All right, well then flip the page. Example two, you're going to do the same thing, except you're going to use the 2014 statistics for American women. And uh, you're going to answer three very similar questions. All right, so I'm going to begin. The first thing I've asked you to do is the mean of American women's height is 65 inches. The standard deviation is 3.5. So you can see according to that, women tend to be shorter. Also, their standard deviation is slightly less, so they're more bunched together. Okay, whereas the men, the men's heights were a little bit more spread out. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a little attribute. Lots of things that occur naturally do, uh, for whatever reason, abide by uh, no the normal curve relationship. So it's interesting uh, when, when you study this. Uh, if you do study this, it has lots and lots of application. So I'm going to label the normal curve. So right here in the middle, 65 inches. And then using my calculator, when I add 3.5, that's 68.5. When I add 3.5 more, that's, is that 72? Am I right on that? and then 75.5. I'm not hearing any objections, so I think I'm doing okay. Then I'm gonna subtract 3.5, so that's gonna be 61.5. Then I'm gonna subtract 3.5 uh, 3 more, and that's going to be, uh, what is that, 68? 
58, yes, even better. And then 58 and then subtract 3.5 more. And I've got 54.5 if I did my, did my subtraction properly. By the way, I know you're probably super curious because I just told you where I was on the normal curve. The smoking hot Mrs. Perkster is four foot 10. So four times 12 is 48 plus 10 is 58. So she is right, right here. This is Mrs. Perkster right here. Yes, we're quite the pair, uh, but so she is two full standard deviations below the mean. Uh, and then, okay, uh, it's a different chart, but I, I'm way up here, uh, just a little bit more than one. Anyway, just interesting to note how things are, things are different in different populations. So now what percent of women have heights between 61.5, which is right here, and 68.5? So that's one standard deviation. So you answered what percentage? Yep, indeed. We're going to select 1,200 randomly, uh, randomly selected women. How many would we expect to have heights between 58 and 72? So 58 is down here, 72 is here. That's two standard deviations, so 95, which we will then multiply by the 1,200. And 0. 0.95 times 1,200 gives me how many women? 1,140, most of them, yes, are going to have that. And then what is the height range that contains 99.7? And that's going to start where? Yep. And it's going to go all the way to 75.5. When you learn a little bit more about it and you can you can play around a little more, you can actually divide up and find the and it's not too hard. We can we'll have time. So we'll probably go ahead and do it just uh, in uh, just for, for funsies uh, after this last problem. So when you take a standardized test like. Probably most of you took the SAT or the ACT at some point in the future. If you go get a master's degree, you'll take the you'll take the uh, GRE or the MCAT or the LSAT. These are all standardized tests. And what it means to take standardized test is a, the test was given to a population. Then when you take it, your result is compared to that population. It's it's what it's called is normalizing the results. And it has to do with the normal curve or the standard deviation. That's why it's called a standardized test. So whatever you got on, so for instance, the uh, attributes of this test that I've given you, this is the mean and the standard deviation of one half of the SAT. So let's say the math portion, because we all love math here. The math portion of the SAT has a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. So if you knew what you got on that portion, we could figure out exactly where you are, and how you compare to the rest of the population, and whether you did or did not do or do not want to know that. But what I want you to do is I'd like you to do the same, the same four things. Label this uh, normal distribution according to those attributes, and then answer the questions. All right, so I'm going to label my normal curve here. The mean of this test is 500. And then the, the standard deviation is 100. So this goes 600, and then 700, and then 800. And then backwards, you've got 400, and then 300, and then 200. 
So then what percent of the results are between 200 and 800? So 200 here is three below, 800 is three above. Three above. So that is the 99.7 from the empirical rule. We're taking a sample of 350 test takers. How many are between 400 and 600? So 400 to 600 is one standard deviation in each direction. So that's 0.68 times that 350. And what does the calculator tell me is the result there? 238? What's wrong? Oh, I know, everybody gets so shy when it's time to say answers. Uh, like I'm going to throw things at you or something, which that might be fun if I had some ping pong balls or something. Anyway, what is the score range that has 95% of results? Yep, two standard deviations in each direction. So 300 to 700. Before I stop the recording, anybody got a question or anything about this? No, because those are a little harder to work with. And they're not as like every, so the question uh, for the camera is, are we gonna do anything like this for the skewed problems? And the answer is no, because whereas every normal curve, because it's symmetric, obeys the empirical rule, there is no similar rule for skewed things. Some things can be really skewed and the tail can be really thick and some things can just be a little bit skewed. And so then there's no, uh, there's no set in stone rule for how, how much the mean, the median, the mode are gonna move. Yes. So for the um, test, we just need to like, know if it's skewed right or left and then where the mean for the skewed distributions, yes. Know the difference between skewed right and skewed left. Remember, the, the, the way it's skewed is which way the tail's going. So skewed to the right means the tail's on the right side. Skewed to the left means the tail's on the, on the left side. And then you need to know what happens to the mean, the median, and the mode in each of those things. So that's, that's the extent of what you need to know uh, there. Um, basically, I gave you the uniform or the rectangular distribution just to introduce this idea of a distribution. Uh, so basically, the only thing I might ask you about that is I might give you a histogram uh, that has that you have to read like we were already doing. So there's not really anything new for you there. Then you need to be familiar with the normal curve and the empirical rule and uh, being able to answer just the questions just like we've just answered. Great. Any other questions? Let me mention, I'm going to shut off the recording because this is all just